Hello folks and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, Discourse and Culture with me, Dr. Matt Martin. I hope you're having a great day today. Uh, today we'll be diving into this book by Doug Iman. It's also called uh, Digital, Digital Rhetoric. Uh, here's a picture of Doug. He's actually a friend of mine. I've met him at several conferences over the years, computers and uh, writing conference. He's the editor, I believe. Yes, the senior editor, I'm sorry of uh, Kairos, a journal of rhetoric, technology, and pedagogy. Uh, that's a fun, it's an online journal that's been around, I guess, since 1996. And uh, it was started by graduate students, which is kind of a fun bit of history there. Uh, but that's certainly a good, still remains a, a good publication if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, but anyway, he wrote the book, basically, uh, Digital Rhetoric, Theory, Method, and Practice. Uh, so when I was looking for books for this course, I thought, well... <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Certainly sounds like this would be germane. I know Doug's a good writer, but uh, I will admit after reading this first chapter, you know, even though this is an advanced class, this is a 400 level class, and I should expect, uh, you know, fairly challenging readings in there. Uh, but, you know, even with that said, though, I think he's referencing a lot of theorists and theories and concepts and movements. You know, he's, he's trying to pack a whole lot into this first chapter. Uh, so if you felt a little bit discombobulated uh, here and there you know don't try not to let that get to you uh, you know it's not you <laughs> it's, just, it's just you may be uh, reading stuff for the first time uh, that he's just casually referring to so you know, I wouldn't think it would be that bad but I thought it would be very helpful very very useful uh, to go through this uh, chapter with you and see if I could shed some light on some of it and gloss over some of it try to make sure you get the main points but you know, that's that's my uh, <laughs> <laughs> opening spiel on, on this book, but it is, you know, of course, very important and germane. This is the probably the real meat of the course in terms of the uh, theory and academic stuff we'll be looking at uh, this semester, throughout the whole semester. All right, so let's see what he does in this chapter, and I've labeled this under the title Today's Objectives. Uh, we'll see if we can hit all four of these. Uh, a Brief History of Rhetoric. And, of course, that alone could be a three-semester sequence. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'll talk more about that when we get to those uh, slides. But that's a huge topic. You know, that could have been just one chapter. Uh, two, discuss the various meanings of the word text. So what he'll do here, he, he talks about what rhetoric means, what text means, and then what digital means. So he's got little sections about different understandings or definitions of those terms. Um, and this is all weaved into the history of this emerging field that he wants us to call digital, digital rhetoric. Uh, but, you know, he'll talk a lot about uh, some similar movements that have historical as well as some stuff still going on uh, that might sound the same. But when you really get, you know, into looking at it, there's some important differences between all of these. And, of course, it all comes back to the people. You know, the labels that people apply to themselves, <laughs> they get applied to them. You know, you never want to lose too much sight of, uh, you know, these are groups of people, the discourse communities, scholars, they have conferences and journals. And so a lot of this is, um, you know, uh, a social, uh, probably more social than uh, anything else. Okay, uh, he opens up with a good old Kenneth Burke, and I mean, how can you go wrong with, with Kinney? <laughs> uh, probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, uh, rhetorician of later years. I believe he was doing most of his writing what, what, back in the 50s and 60s, maybe. Uh, but anyway, still a key figure. And I love this quote he found from Burke. Uh, I didn't write down the Burke book where he got this from, but it's quoted on page 12. And he's, uh, I'm in this here just talking about, you know, what is rhetoric? you got all these different definitions. If you've taken English 191 or any of the theory classes on rhetoric, you know this. A lot of people have different uh, ways to go about it. Uh, but anyway, according to Burke, he says, uh, wherever there is persuasion, there is rhetoric. And wherever there is meaning, there is persuasion. Okay, that first little bit there, most people would probably agree with, except maybe rhetoricians. <laughs> uh, but the second bit is a little more controversial, as we'll see. You know, this idea that what something means is rhetorical. You know, that's still, you know, a lot of people take issue with that sort of idea. You know, that they're, uh, you know, they would say, well, there's knowledge, you know, there's the facts, there's the truth, and that's not rhetorical. Uh, rhetorical is just kind of what makes things look nicer, or, or rhetoric is the, 
that persuasive element, you know, it's when you don't know for sure about something, you might use rhetoric to try to sway the, the masses. <laughs> and it's that, that kind of idea in the, uh, in the public sphere, I suppose. But Burke is saying, no, no, you know, wherever there is meaning, there is persuasion. Uh, and then he gives an example that I, I just love this example. Food. Uh, food, eaten and digested, is not rhetorical. Uh, so if you're on that show Naked and Afraid and you're eating a grasshopper or a snake, <laughs> you know, okay, you're just eating that because you're going to starve to death if you don't eat it, or at least unless the uh, the crew isn't slipping you protein bars, but, uh, but that's another issue. Uh, so anyway, you got food like that. Yeah, it's a substance. You have to have it or you, you perish. And so he says that's not rhetorical, but food is more than just survival, right? I mean, there, there's a meaning behind food. He says, but in the meaning of food, there is much rhetoric, the meaning being persuasive enough for the idea of food to be used like the ideas of religion as a rhetorical device for statesmen. And I think instead of statesmen, we could just think about politicians there. <laughs> And uh, you don't have to look hard for an example of politicians using food, not as a basic survival item. You know, I, I, if I don't eat this hot dish, I'm going to perish. <laughs> you know, nothing like this. No, 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 no. They, they, these politicians are using, this is an example here. It's uh, our senator, Amy uh, Klobuchar. And she's uh, eating this hot dish. Uh, but again, the, the hot dish you know, she could have eaten anything, right? But it's, no, it's got to be hot dish because it's got this sort of cultural meaning. It's kind of this Minnesotan thing. You know, where I grew up in Louisiana, it would be crawfish, and jambalaya. You know, if you're a senator in Louisiana, I'm sure there's a big deals always made about, look, here I am eating the crawfish. I love the mud bugs. I'm, you know, pinching the tails and sucking the heads, you know, and going all in. Look how Louisianian I am, you know, with this crawfish. With this jambalaya, the etouffee, I'm making myself hungry here. Uh, and same thing up here with Klobuchar, right? It's the, you know, yes, it's food. It's meant to be eaten and digested, but that's not the point here. Uh, the point is this rhetorical, you know, idea. It's like, I'm one of you. I'm, look how Minnesotan I am. I'm eating the, the hot dish. I think she even has her own recipe. And there's an article here from businessinsider.com where I got this example from, and it's about politicians have a long history of using food to get people to vote for them, and this year's election is no exception. So I think this is fairly recent. Well, <laughs> recent in Matt years. <laughs> uh, 2020, February. Uh, but it talks in here about uh, how this goes all the way back to Rome and Greece, you know, these, these ideas, and sometimes use the food to get people to come out and vote, period. Uh, but I, I like this idea of sort of the, this cultural, you know, every region has its own dishes and the politicians will, you know, pretend at least to like those dishes just to kind of appeal. Another example is with beers, too. Like, uh, I forget who it was, but there was some... I'm getting a little bit off topic, I feel like. <laughs> but, you, but you get the idea, right? It's, you know, look, I'm one of you. I'm eating the food that you eat, not this fancy stuff. All right, what is rhetoric? Uh, so Ayman dives into this, and again, uh, when I was in college, I had three different courses. I had a history of rhetoric. It was, uh, one of them was called classical rhetoric. I got this here on, on this uh, point number three. Uh, then there was one called medieval and renaissance, and then there was a, another one, I think, I don't think it was enlightenment. I think it went from uh, classical to, I think they called it transition. <laughs> Uh, and then the last one was modern. Uh, so they just had three sequences, but it, I'm pretty sure at USF there was a fourth one even. Uh, so again, you could easily spend three or four semesters. We're not going to be able to do this justice in one, one lecture, and Iman's not going to be able to do it in one chapter. Uh, but the point is just to try to get some, some idea of how this subject of rhetoric, as it's been taught in universities and school, schools over the centuries, basically, it's undergone a lot of uh, transitions, uh, you know, at one point, you just, there was only three subjects, you know, it's rhetoric, um, uh, rhetoric, grammar, and logic. You know, those were the trivial, the, the three that everybody <coughs> learned. And then later there was the quadrivium, which brought in things like music and astronomy, uh, I think maybe arithmetic. What was the other one? 
<laughs> anyway, uh, so th this has been around for a long, long time, but it hasn't always meant the same things. Uh, far from it. Uh, so we can, I think uh, Iman is right here. You know, we, we could say, well, we'll just go with Aristotle's definition, or we'll just call it persuasion, or whatever. But the fact is that nobody's going to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many different definitions out there. That's about the best we can do is just look at some different periods of history and try to figure out, like, uh, well, what was going on in society at that time and that culture that made rhetoric uh, be taught like this as opposed to how it is now. Uh, so after going through some various definitions, and I'll just quickly gloss over these, I guess. So the Greek and Roman there were thinking about of course, uh, Aristotle with that ethos, logos, and pathos, and those different types of uh, rhetorical occasions. You know, the whether it's in the, the courtrooms and the senate halls, and sometimes rhetoric was used just for kind of display purposes of ceremonies. Uh, up through the uh, Roman periods, where you get, start to get those breakdown into canons, and in those periods, it was very, very important to be able to speak publicly. Uh, so you had to go up and give a good speech, basically. Uh, that was a big part of a civic life. And they would teach you, you know, how do you make a good speech? Here's some templates to use, basically. Uh, you know, here's some uh, topoi, they called it, <laughs> some common topics. Um, little facts and his things from history you could sort of sprinkle into your speech to make it more interesting. Uh, here's, you know, how to work on the structure of it. And, you know, they even had, like, training in body language and gestures, you know, and speech uh, kind of what you think about in a public speaking class. Uh, so that was the model for many, 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 many years. Uh, but then things started to change as we got to medieval times and the, and the Renaissance. Um, you know, there, of course, there was less need for public speaking because you had a king. <laughs> you don't really argue with the king. Uh, that tends to get your uh, your head chopped off, right, if, you, if you're out making these speeches then. So instead, the rhetoric shifted from being about public speak speeches uh, to being able to write really good letters. A lot of great letter writing, and of course, uh, great sermons was another uh, area where there was a lot of interest. You know, you want to be able to write a good sermon, you know, for the priests, I suppose. Um, let's see, and then Enlightenment, uh, this is where rhetoric starts to get into trouble uh, because you have all these scientific types coming out, and they're saying, well, we just want the facts. You know, we need to be able to articulate ourselves clearly and there's a lot of uh, things being translated, you know, as the rise of science. You know, a lot of people don't realize this, but, you know, a lot of the science, uh, just like everything else back then, is either written in Latin uh, or maybe German. You know, German was a huge scientific country for a long, long time. So most, if you wanted to read science, you had to know, or if you want to be a scientist, you had to know German, read all this German material. And, of course, when they're going from German to English and to French and all these languages, it helps a lot if you can uh, do that easily. Uh, so you want to be able to reproduce the experiment that this French uh, scientist did. It's written in French. You're trying to do it in German. <laughs> so you still have to be able to get all the, uh, you know, the, the amounts and the timings and all that stuff right to be able to duplicate that experiment or method, right? Um, so all that meant that uh, these uh, writers and these journals uh, these editors were saying, look, come away from the fancy rhetoric. You know, we don't need, like, this poetic form anymore. <laughs> no elegance. Uh, just, you know, state things as simply and clearly as you can uh, so that when it gets translated or when people are trying to reproduce the experiment, uh, they'll be able to uh, to follow that. And there was, you know, this was a pretty big deal. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, rhetoric kind of got a bad name during this period because it was associated with uh, style and really flowery language. You know, it's good for poets and so on, but <laughs> not good for, uh, you know, serious science. Uh, so that's when it started to get this bad rep. And, uh, of course, in the contemporary times, scholars have gone back and they've, they've questioned the value of that and said, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, you know, try to say that... Uh, you got the facts over here and rhetoric over here, right? Uh, those, those quotes we were looking at before, you know, with Burke, you know, that wherever there's meaning, there's there's some type of persuasion. Whenever there's uh, persuasion, there's some form of rhetoric, right? So we can't just make those clean breaks uh, that those Enlightenment critics were, were making, trying to make. All right, so that brings us up to Iman then, and he, again, talks about a lot of different definitions, but he settles on 
the ones that he says, uh, quote, highlights the relationship between rhetoric and knowledge production and meaning making, not just as a mechanism for persuasion. Uh, so that's one piece of this. Uh, and I think most modern rhetoricians would say, yeah, I'm not just here to teach you about how to be persuasive, you know, how to bamboozle people. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, and I also reject this notion that you got the rhetoric on one side, the truth uh, on the other, you know, kind of a kind of platonic <laughs> uh, thing there. Uh, instead, we really want to look closely at things that people might say are objective and say, you know, maybe it's not as objective as you think. Or maybe there's a little bit of subjectivity in there, <laughs> a little bit of room for rhetoric. And, you know, the closer you look at it, of course, the more you realize, yeah, there's a, actually a lot of room. Um, so that's one piece. And the other piece is that rhetoric, uh, it shouldn't just be used to analyze things. And so one, one application for rhetoric is you just, you learn all these terms and concepts, and then you say, let's look at this speech, or let's look at this commercial, you know, advertisement, whatever the case may be, and like diagram it out, and, you know, try to study it using those terms. Uh, but he says, we want to go beyond that, and it should, we want to kind of hold on to this classical notion that we're not just here to analyze things, but actually to make things. So one of the reasons we study all these ancient speeches, or whatever the case may be, is so we can borrow some of those ideas. Right? You get better at rhetoric, and you can actually go out and make a better speech or a better uh, website, you know, as the case may be, better blog, you know, whatever it is you're working on. <clears throat> we want to be able to apply these uh, rhetorical theories not just to analyze something, uh, but to be able to use it to apply it uh, for our own purposes. Okay. Uh, so then Iman talks about why do we need uh, a separate thing? Like, why can't we just... Just, just call it rhetoric, you know, what's what's so special about this digital stuff uh, where it needs its own subject and its own uh, set of theories. And I agree with him. He, he comes up with three reasons on page 17. He says, uh, uh, first of all, a lot of those, uh, the classical rhetoric stuff, and we talked about this already, were made for different times, different culture, you know, every, you know, in the Greek times, for example, the public speaking was huge. <laughs> I mean, if you couldn't write a good, if you couldn't, uh, you know, put together a good sp speech and deliver and memorize uh, the speech, you were kind of uh, screwed. Uh, you know, nowadays, I don't know if that's really all that pertinent. I mean, it is, of course, for some people, but most of us aren't really in uh, jobs where we have to frequently, you know, give these uh, speeches all the time. And so you can make a pretty good case that the theories that were that worked really good for that stuff, you know, maybe or maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't work so great for writing. Uh, for example, there's uh, uh, this canon in Roman times of the uh, of memory, of being able to memorize things. Uh, that was a big part of uh, rhetorical training. You, know, you, you had to get better and learn mnemonics and all these strategies uh, for being able to memorize huge chunks of uh, information. Uh, does that make sense to fixate on that nowadays? I mean, uh, maybe... Uh, but that's kind of, to me, one of those things that, yeah, it probably would, it makes a lot a lot of sense when you're talking about a public speaking scenario. Writing, I don't see it so much, and certainly not once we get into, like, <laughs> writing for the Internet. <laughs> you know, I can just Google, uh, look on Wikipedia for that sort of thing. I don't need to memorize, you know, tons and tons of uh, uh, material anymore. Thank, thank, thank God. <laughs> uh, so that's one piece. Uh, the second one is... Uh, maybe some of these ex existing theories don't apply. Maybe they, they do apply, but they just need some updating. Uh, or we might just need an entirely new theory, so we can't just say every, you know, some people think basically every, what Aristotle said about rhetoric is really all you need to say. <laughs> I mean, he's a, one of the big geniuses of all time. You know, it, it worked for thousands and thousands of years. Why do we need to question Aristotle? Uh, let's just keep using that. You know, and obviously, uh, you know, people want to get paid <laughs> for developing new new approaches. Uh, so he's probably right there. Um, and then three, uh, he wants to put a little boundary condition. You know, that's kind of a strange way to put this, a boundary condition necessary for a new field of study. Uh, but you don't want it to, you know, one of the problems with trying to be too broad with an academic subject is if you just say, well, we're just, you know, we're studying everything. 
right? <laughs> the rhetoric, it could be anything. Um, and, you know, same thing when we get to this word text. A lot of people say, what is a text? Well, a text could be anything. Could be a building. Could be, you know, all this stuff beyond books. And it's kind of fun to say something like that. But on the other hand, it's like it's almost you really don't study anything if you just study everything. Right, there's, there's no sense of coherence, there's no sense of a shared purpose when you get too freaking <laughs> big with the, uh, the topic. So I think he's probably right on all three of these things. Uh, okay, so then he moves on to talking about uh, this word digital, and I talked about that when we started this course. You know, there was discussion here at St. Cloud State. Should we call it digital rhetoric? It used to be called computers in English. Um, you know, you go to other universities, they might still call it that. Or they, they might call it le electronic rhetoric or <laughs> writing for the web. I mean, the web rhetoric, internet rhetoric or something. I mean, there's just unlimited terms. And the, uh, you know, the fact is you can make a case, and Nyman does this. Uh, yeah, this term, digital, works pretty well for this in this way. On the other hand, it does have these problems. But, you know, every term is going to be like that. It's going to some people will like it. Some people will say, oh, my God, digital. <laughs> what, what crap? You know, why, why, why do you want to change the name to that? Uh, what, what happened to, I like computers in English, or I like the new media was awesome, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think to some extent this is just a fashion almost. Uh, but he makes a pretty good point here on, uh, like, why he likes to call it digital. He says that, he likes it because it kind of focuses your attention on like the digi digital nature of it. Uh, so these, what does that mean? So if it's digi digitized, you know, one thing it means is you can just copy that. You know, if you got a PDF file, for example, unless it's got some kind of a copy protection on it, I suppose. But you know, you, generally speaking, you know, I could just say, oh, you know, you want you want this PDF? You know, I put it on D2L, and you can download that sucker. <laughs> You know, we can, I can download it a thousand, a million times. It'll be fine, right? We can all read the same uh, PDF file. Uh, and we can also manipulate it in various ways. You know, you can highlight things and do all the stuff you can do with Adobe and, uh, or Microsoft Word and programs like that. And that's pretty cool. And it's certainly something that you, you couldn't do it as easily, at least, if it was printed. Yeah, yes, you could make photocopies. Yes, you could mail the photocopies or whatever. Uh, but that's going to be a whole lot more work uh, than it would be, you know, doing it digitally. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember some of my first jobs where <laughs> we're digitizing things. You know, I would go to, I remember working at uh, some law firms in Florida and some, uh, God, some kind of biomedical firm. I don't even remember the name of it, but. Basically, they had all this paper stuff, and they were, they hired people to come in and do data entry, right? And type all the stuff in, or you know, where you could. For some reason, I guess you couldn't just scan it; you had to like type it in. But that was a big job for a long time, and of course, they wanted to do that because instead of having these huge warehouses f full of paper, well, you can just have a thumb drive <laughs> with all everything on it, or even uh, just have it stored somewhere online. And so that's a pretty big deal. Certainly, I think. That's important to keep that in mind at all times. We're not talking about something that's hard to copy. Uh, and then secondly, he says digital text is composed of discrete bits susceptible to fragmentation. And I'm not quite sure what, he, what he's getting at here with this wave and particle idea. Uh, yes, I guess when you get right down to it, uh, digital text, you know, at somewhere, at some level, this is zeros and ones, <laughs> some kind of hex code, you know, it's machine readable in ways that's, that, are, that aren't human readable, and, you know, I guess you could keep that in mind. Uh, it's certainly, I would agree that you don't want to think about the internet or digital information as being just uh, like this magical ether. Uh, you know, sometimes it's talked about like that, like this cyberspace, you know, like there's this kind of weird metaphysical realm <laughs> where information just exists uh you know that that's certainly not true you know if you had to, if you ever had to buy a new hard drive because your computer is full and you have to get another drive to put your stuff on you know this stuff does take up space you know it, it, it's not like a bookshelf with books on it 
Uh, but in a sense, it is, you know, because you have to you run out of space on that Google account <laughs> or whatever. You have to upgrade it, you know. So at some some place somewhere, there's a server farm with that, you know, uh, those zeros and ones sitting on it uh, that add up to your documents. So you don't want to forget that either. So maybe he's uh, right here. And I think he even mentions at one point that the word digital, <laughs> you know, literally, you know, it's thinking about the digits of your hand. You know, I guess you, you type it in. I don't know where that, uh, you know, where that comes in. Okay, uh, now on to texts. So we're using a digital rhetoric to study texts. But what the heck do we mean by text? And again, people say it could mean like a text could be a building. You could... You could read a building like a text, you know, and think about a like an essay has an introduction, a body, a conclusion, and so on and so forth. And a building, you know, you could say, well, there's the, you know, the entrance to the building is kind of like the introduction. <laughs> the hallway is kind of your uh, body paragraphs or, you know, something like kind of like that. Uh, you can look at just about anything using those classical rhetorical uh, canons and, and models. Uh, you can think about the ethos. And I've used this example in some of my classes. We've talked about food already, but I think about uniforms. You know, I often think about ethos and uh, various types of pilot. If you get on an airline, airplane, and the, you know, the pilots, are, if you sometimes they have the little cockpit open, you can look at it and see these uh, pilots sitting there. And all the ones I've ever seen have been in nice uniforms, right? Very crisp, iron. It's, like, it's almost like military, <laughs> you know, formality. You know, they look very uh, official uh, in those uniforms. And part of that, I'm sure, is that they want to look, you know, uh, professional and, and, and uh, qualified <laughs> to fly that airplane. So that's kind of like ethos, right? And that's just clothing. Uh, but, of course, you could talk about the same concept in an essay. If you've got a bunch of uh, misspellings all over the place, you know, that's kind of like that pilot uh, having a bunch of stains uh, all over uh, their uniform. All right, you, you could say that, I don't know about getting on this plane. It, you know, if the pilot can't even, you know, get their uniform looking uh, <laughs> looking right, <laughs> uh, maybe I can't trust uh, the, the, them to fly the plane. You know, same thing with that essay, right? So you can apply all these concepts to just about anything. Uh, but uh, he says, you know, we do want to limit it in some ways. And I think, again, I have to agree with him. You know, I find myself agreeing with Lyman. I guess maybe that's <laughs> why I like the book. <laughs> Uh, but he says, let's just talk about it this way. So text, to be a text, it has to have certain things. Uh, so it has to have rhetorical features. And so again, it couldn't be the food that you just eat because you're starving. Right? There has to be some kind of meaning beyond that. Uh, and he says that anything would have to have some kind of meaning, I guess, beyond an immediate survival scenario. So some kind of rhetorical feature. Uh, originate in and propel social action. So that's a little bit more specific there, right? You want to, this, the text to do something, or the reader or the viewer to go do something after, you know, if they, if they agree with what you're saying or writing, it's not enough. You can't just stop there, right? There has to be some purpose beyond just, the, oh, that was nice. <laughs> you know, what do you want me to do uh, after I've read this? Um, designed material objects. So I think the example he gives of something that wasn't a design material object would be just talking in your sleep and just randomly spouting words. You know, there's no real design to that. There's no real intention behind that. You're not even awake. <laughs> you know, it's like stuff you're saying, you're, you're not even conscious. So we're not going to include that. Um, he says, these qualities provide the primary means of relationship between a text and rhetoric as use. So if we think about a say a LinkedIn profile, uh, you could say, well, there's a, it's got rhetorical features, obviously. You're trying to uh, persuade somebody that you're credible at your job or that you are a good candidate uh, for a position, right? You do that in various ways using ethos, logos, and pathos. Uh, the social action there, obviously, you want, uh, well, there's a couple of them, right? You want somebody to like your profile and say that, yeah, this you know, Matt over here, he's a good teacher, or whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe I'm not on the job market, thankfully, but if I were, uh, one of the social actions would be, hey, if you're an employer, you know, hire me. Uh, design material objects, that's 
the main reason people like LinkedIn because it, it does a lot of this design work for them. You know, it you can tell that you know, <laughs> this isn't just a random, <laughs> you know, uh, collection of words. No, this is a very designed uh, uh, profile. You know, it looks good, looks looks uh, authentic. So you, you, hopefully you're beginning to see, you know, what he's talking about there. So all these, I think the intentionality is, is key here, because some people try to include things under the title of rhetoric that, uh, you know, just, just really just don't belong there. Um, when, you know, another example off the top of my head, and people sometimes talk about a rock. So if you're just walking along the sidewalk and you see a rock over there, uh, it's not really rhetorical, it's just a rock. Uh, but, you know, you could pick up the rock and use it in some kind of artistic production of some sort and then it would have a little bit of intentionality behind it of course you can you know, pick up the rock and throw it at somebody as, as a weapon uh, some kind of protest <coughs> statement you know in that sense that would be rhetorical you know we get into that same topic all the time on these these gardening shows i like to watch and my wife and i watch all these <laughs> gardening shows and sometimes it comes up this idea of uh, i want a natural very natural looking garden I, I want this to look like nature. <laughs> and then usually the host will say, well, in that case, what you're talking about is not a garden. Because the whole point of a garden is for somebody to design it you know, and pick certain plants and arrange them in a certain fashion. Uh, you know, if you want nature, go out in the woods. <laughs> uh, so anyway, usually what they mean by something natural is actually not natural. It's just as... Actually, it, it, it takes a lot of uh, more work and skill uh, to make something look sort of faux natural, I suppose, uh, than it would just to do the standard sorts of, uh, <clears throat> you know, borders. Anyway, I'm off topic again. <laughs> All right, he talks about digital rhetoric, and uh, this is where he's really zeroing in on his main topic for the book. So he, uh, he gives, again, a lot of examples. I'm not going to try to talk about all those folks, Lanham, Malthrop, Welch, Zappin, and Warnick. He likes uh, this Warnick book, Rhetoric Online. It's kind of dated now. I think it's like 97 or so. But I agree with him. If you've, uh, I've got this book. It's really good. You can, you can read it. <laughs> it's not unreadable. And uh, I think this is Barbara Warnick. And she talks about these concepts that make something, uh, I guess, online rhetoric, ethos, interactive and intertextual so the ethos we kind of talked about that already <coughs> right how do you uh you know sometimes you're on a forum um, i'm on a forum sometimes called stock twits and this is a bunch of folks you know another one's reddit uh, but the stock twits is a bunch of folks that talk about various stocks and whether they think the stocks are going to go up or they're going to go down uh, how's this company doing is it a good time to invest? Should you buy? Should you sell? Should you get options? And so on and so forth. So the ethos is key there. Because you, you're just looking at these, but you don't know who these people are, right? It's just, just some random people from the internet, basically. Uh, but there's certain ways that they can word things and use certain terms. And even something like correct punctuation <laughs> might make you think, okay, this one here looks a little bit more, you know, this, this looks more credible. I, I think I'll listen to this one. Uh, I'll take this one more seriously than this one that's just a big meme of a little kid dancing. <laughs> like a, a meme of a dancing kid not really doing much for me. Uh, whereas the one above that, you know, it's, it's well-worded, articulated. There's a source, some statistics cited, you know, I'm just making stuff up, but you get the idea, right? Um, on the other hand, maybe the dancing kid <laughs> strikes a chord. I, I don't know. Uh, interactivity is another key thing. You know, and, and again, people will argue, well, you could always write the author of a book a letter, you know, if it's still living. Ah, sure, you know, whatever. And we all know it's a lot easier to interact with somebody online. You can, it could be just as simple as the old thumbs up, thumbs down type system, or you, you could actually make a comment, you know, and in, interact with people. Uh, that seems to be a key thing. Uh, the intertextuality is another one that's, Again, yeah, with a book forum, you could you, you have the references. You know, you're, you're quoting, you're, you're citing people, and the idea is you, know, you could go out and get that other book. You know, if I, I'm citing uh, Iman, you know, the idea is you could pick up this copy of uh, Iman's book and read it. Uh, so that's kind of intertextual. It just means you're kind of bringing in all these different texts, uh, 
you know, there's no text that just stands completely uh, alone. You know, all the text reference somehow another another text, and so on and so forth. It's kind of a nat the nature of the <laughs> of using human language, if you think about it. You know, we're not just uh, we don't create our own language. You just sort of you're, you're born, you learn this language that's existed before you and will exist after you, and you you know you might bend it and blur it a little bit, but you're just kind of working with this language, and it's the same thing when you sit down to write a book. You know, you can't truly write something that's never been written before uh, <clears throat> because it just wouldn't make any sense. It would be like, uh, you know, some, some type of gibberish. Uh, it'd just be nonsense. Uh, you know, you, you have to expect people to have read other things uh, to be able to have any sort of context uh, for what you're writing. Okay, let's see. Ian Bogost. Uh, yeah, we move on to him. He's a... Uh, I, I feel like I've talked about him a lot in my game studies course, but anyway, his claim to fame, besides the video game stuff, is his notion of procedural rhetoric. Uh, so he, Bogost and Iman talk about how you got the visual rhetoric and, you know, I forget, several different kinds of rhetoric uh, that deal with things beyond uh, text and speeches, you know, words, basically. Uh, and Bogo says we need another one for procedures. And he's thinking here about syst things that are systematized somehow. It doesn't have to be computers, but he spends most of the time talking about things that can be uh, computed on. So again, if it's a digitized thing, once you get it into a digital format, then you can perform all these operations on it. You know, you can sort it. You can do word counts. You know, just a couple of easy ones. Uh, there's all the stuff you can easily do once it's in that, that format. Uh, but Bogo says that you know, there's there's certain unique persuasive potentials, I guess, in these in these uh, in this uh, new in these new systems, these new formats. He's got some great examples in his book. Uh, he's got a book called Persuasive Games. I highly recommend that. Again, very very readable and and fun. But he talks. One of the examples he gives in there is uh, that kind of stuck with me. He he was saying that he was he was talking about a car advertisement, and the focus of the car. Or the focus of the ad was on how much stuff you could put in the trunk of this car. Right? It's, it's designed in such a way that they really wanted to emphasize, like, you could put a lot of stuff in the trunk <laughs> of this uh, uh, of this car. <clears throat> so they could have just made a standard print ad, uh, but instead of doing that, they had a, uh, a website, an app. And the idea, yeah, on one side, you had all this stuff, you know, baby strollers, groceries, I don't know. Uh, but you could click, <coughs> you're supposed to click it drag the each item into the car trunk and you know you're doing it and you're like wow put that no i guess i got more room putting that and putting that and put and it kind of made you feel like look you know i really feel like i put a whole lot of stuff into this trunk wow you know now i am persuaded there's you could put a lot of stuff <laughs> in the trunk and so that was uh, using these uh the computer basically the uh, you know the app those features that programming uh, it was persuasive in ways that you really couldn't get across just by watching a commercial of somebody putting that stuff into the trunk because it, it didn't feel like it was, you know, if you're just watching it, arguably, uh, that's different than if you're, like, actually clicking and dragging things in yourself. You know, you kind of feel like you're personally involved in it. And uh, Bogo says, I don't know if he necessarily says that's more persuasive, but it's certainly true. It's different. Right? Uh, there's something different going on there rhetorically. Uh, than just watching somebody else, seeing it demonstrated. Okay, then he brings in Elizabeth Losh, and she has done, I really love her work, um, <clears throat> I haven't read Virtual Politic yet, it's on the list, uh, but she's got one of the greatest uh, English 191 books. It's a comic book version. <laughs> <laughs> she teamed up with a few people, a couple of, I think, three other people to do this uh, comic book version of an English 191 book, <clears throat> or what used to be called First Year Competition, uh, Composition. So anyway, very, very cool scholar. And she's got this book, Virtual Politic, an electronic history of government media making in a time of war, scandal, disaster, miscommunication, and mistakes. I mean, this sounds like dynamite to me. I really want to read this. Uh, but anyway, she talks... Let's see how he describes it here somewhere. Uh, anyway, I guess the book is about a lot about politics, but somewhere in there, well, page 36 apparently, 
Uh, she talks about... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me back up a little bit. All right, so Lash talks about what she means by the term digital rhetoric, and she's got a four-pronged uh, definition that she uses to organize the book. And then Iman uh, talks about her breakdown here, and he's got some issues with, with each one of these things. <clears throat> you know, I feel like Iman kind of comes across as a little bit of a persnickety uh, in this book, but he's not like that in, in life. <clears throat> All right, anyway, um, let's look at these definitions quickly. So Lash says, uh, one understanding or one definition is just everyday digital discourses. So you think about all the Facebooking you do and the tweeting and the, oh, God only knows, right? The TikToking. <laughs> What's that other one? The Snapchatting. You know, you name it. <clears throat> People are doing that every day. Some insane number of hours. Uh, and, you know, there's definitely some persuasion going on there. And some meaning making. Uh, so she says, that's one definition. He's, and Iman says, that's really broad, right? Uh, the second one she talks about in her book is public rhetoric via electronic networks. So she's talking there about governments, government communication. Let's see, when was this book written? Um, I'm just wondering if it was written before or after a certain uh, <laughs> president who loved to tweet. Yeah, let's see. Um, no, this is, must be a little earlier because she's talking about... Oh, 2009, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, <clears throat> she's talking here about 9-11, PowerPoint presentations by government officials and gadflies, email as a channel for whistleblowing, digital satire of surveillance practices, national digital libraries, <clears throat> computer-based trainings, Digital real politique aimed at preserving its own power. Regulation casting as criminal. Such common online activities as file sharing, video game play, and social networking. And I wonder if she talks in there about the uh, <coughs> the censorship discussions. But, uh, but anyway, I guess that's one thing to think about is how the government is using uh, the Internet, you know, to, for lack of a better word, to control people or I guess manipulate or inform people, you know, depending on how you want to slice that. Um, let's see, third, the emerging scholarly discipline. So the, you know, you could, eventually you'll be able to study and get a PhD in digital rhetoric if you can already. So Iman says, you know, yeah, he probably agrees with that since he wrote a book called Digital Rhetoric, and I obviously agree with it because <laughs> we have a class. <laughs> but he says, you know, she leaves out some key works, and that, that tends to happen. And he really doesn't like her fourth one, Mathematical Theories of Communication, he just thinks that's kind of a rabbit hole, basically, and it's not worth, uh, doesn't really have much to offer. Okay, let's see what he does here. Uh, similar terms to digital rhetoric, so there's some competition out there. You could study electric rhetoric. I guess that sounds a little bit too 60s or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm an electric rhetoric. Doesn't work for me. <clears throat> um, another one was computational rhetoric yeah, i don't know sounds a little bit <laughs> boring i mean <laughs> computational who wants to say that you know five times fast uh and then the one that he says is actually pretty cool techno rhetoric i'm a techno rhetorician uh, he doesn't really say that but when i hear that word, i think about music <laughs> like the, you know the techno music scene it's like do 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 rhetoric you know Kind of almost a silly term. Uh, so I think Iman is, is <laughs> you know, don't you think, I think we all can agree that digital digital rhetoric is probably the best choice given that selection. Um, let's see, what else do, does he talk about in here? Oh, he finally gets around to defining what he, mean, what he means by digital rhetoric. On page 43, it starts on 43, bleeds over to 44. So digital, what is digital rhetoric? It's the application of rhetorical theory as analytic method or heuristic for production to digital texts and performances. So here, everything has come together, right? So all those different words he talked about, the digital, the rhetoric, text, and digital. And remember, he said that he didn't want it to, just, to study it. Uh, you, you also want to be able to produce it. So that's what he means here by this word heuristic for production, so it's going to give you some ideas, some, some plans, <clears throat> some ways, basically some methods um, 
for creating your own uh, digital texts and performances. So it's not just uh, you know a studying; it's also a production aspect or an application is uh, built into this. So it's it's quite a bit of stuff packed into this definition, but I feel like we've kind of covered it all pretty well <laughs> at this point. Uh, so you know what it covers, what it doesn't cover, and what it's trying to do. Now he says it includes some stuff from the Zappin, Zappin's list. That's a fun name. Um, the use of rhetorical strategies in production and analysis of digital text. Check. Identifying characteristics, affordances, and constraints of new media. So the affordances are basically features, you know, things that allows you to do uh, knobs you can turn, switches you can flip, you know, those are affordances. Versus constraints, which are things that are kind of built in limitations. You know, you can't turn that, you know, certain controllers, uh, you know, won't let you go in certain directions, maybe. Um, you know, the, the steering wheel, <laughs> it was kind of constrained so that it doesn't, you know, easily, you can, you can do some stuff to adjust it, right? But it doesn't just go up and down like this as you're trying to drive. <laughs> you know, so there's some constraints built into it. Uh, you know, that, that same sort of principles of the affords and constraints are in all of these um, interfaces. <clears throat> the formation of digital identities and the potential for building a social community. So he likes all of those. But he's also going to uh, add some of his own ideas. So inquiry and development of rhetorics of technology. <clears throat> well, that'll be very interesting to see what he means by that. The use of rhetorical methods for uncovering and interrogating ideologies and cultural formations in the digital, digital work. An examination of the rhetorical function of networks. Theorization of agency when interlocutors are as likely to be software agents. Or spimes. <laughs> you know, he used that term spimes, spemes, like Bruce Sterling. Why aren't they just calling these bots? <laughs> I think he means bots. I don't know where that weird word comes from. Uh, yeah, but certainly, you see, like that stock twits discussion board I was telling you about, uh, some of those are actually people. Uh, these bots. And the same thing on Twitter. And you know, they use algorithms to, to write things and collect information and present information about the stocks. Uh, you know, sometimes it's useful. It's not like they're all just spam bots or, or, or uh, bad. Um, but it is something you have to think about. Like, this is clearly something different going on here with these bots uh, than if there were a person there making that same, that same argument. So I think this is all really good stuff to be studying. You know, it makes a lot of sense to me. I like the way he's uh, broken all this down. Uh, then he, let's see, he wraps up with a couple of uh, other fields. And you can start, you know, hopefully you can get a sense of, from reading this, like there's all these different conferences and journals and scholars in various fields where they're all kind of talking around or close to the same thing. You know, we're talking about websites and video games and uh, apps and uh, all this sort of digital um, stuff. But, you know, it's different when it's coming from, say, uh, computer science or psychology or sociology or you know all or all these different fields software studies you know <laughs> it's an endless stream <laughs> of similar sounding uh, fields and uh, Iman says that you know really this is probably a lot of uh, you know instead of having everybody doing their own thing and being in like silos or not talking to each other you know maybe we should look and see what each one of these has to offer see if we can uh, create some synergies maybe uh, between some, between and among all these different studies, but man, there are quite a few: uh, digital literacy, visual rhetoric, new media, human-computer interactions, critical code studies, digital humanities, and then internet studies. And I'm sure he probably could have added another, you know, seven or ten, ten to that list. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think this is a good spot for us to stop here today. I uh, hope you know. I hope this give you. Uh, this gave you some sense of the diversity in this, the breadth of it, uh, as well as a sense of where we're going from here you know, as we start trying to uh, move from the background and the introductory kind of theoretical stuff uh, into how you actually apply it uh, to uh, producing everything from blogs to tweets to, you know, <laughs> wiki pages. You know, we're going to have a lot of fun, uh, but hopefully this was a good uh, foundation for you. Uh, if you do have questions, comments, whatever it is, love to hear from you. But I will stop it here and see you next time.